Okay, so in the previous class, we were talking about we were talking about Bode plot, and in the Bode plot, we said uh, that if two uh, two systems are together, and you look at the Bode plot of individual systems, uh, if you put them in a series, then the Bode plot will just get added, right? So this was this was the last thing we discussed in the previous class. Now, today we are going to talk about Bode plot in greater detail. And in particular, we will talk about the Bode plot for the first order system and the second order system. And then we'll look at also the step response and the, uh, uh, what was that? The, the impulse response and the step response for the first and second order system. So let me remind you, We will go with the following first order system. So tau dy over dt plus yt equals to xt. This is the first order system that we will be discussing today. And then the second order system we will discuss is um, let me check. So this is the second order system that we will talk about. Uh, this is uh, written in the standard form, um, you know, because these are easy to analyze systems. Uh, but of course, in real world, the first order and second order system, the coefficients could be quite different from what is shown on the screen. But getting to those solutions is pretty easy once you understand what the solutions to these two systems look like. Okay, so this is our first order system. This is our second order system. So let's talk about the first order system now. So if I look at this differential equation, what's the frequency response of this system? So let's try to compute that. I'm going to take the Fourier transform on both the sides and I get tau j omega y of j omega plus y of j omega equals to x of j omega. How would I compute the Fourier, uh, the frequency response of the system? Anyone remembers? This is Y of J omega. Over X of J omega. What would this be equal to? One over tau j omega plus one. Right, one over tau j omega plus one. Now, in order to compute, in order to uh, uh, compute the body, not compute, but plot the body plot of this particular system, we need to have an idea of 20 log base 10 absolute value of H of J omega 
and I need to know the angle of h of j omega. These are the two things I need to know as a function of omega. And once we understand these two quantities, then we can easily plot the Bode plot, right? Because that's log omega versus 20 log base 10 h omega and angle of h omega. Okay, any questions so far? I think it's extremely important. Uh, by now, you should be extremely comfortable with this mapping going from the differential equation to h of j omega. Um, this is, uh, it should be your second nature within a few days. You should be able to do this computation within seconds. Okay. So now that we understand this is what H of J omega for this first order system looks like, let's try to compute the 20 log absolute value of H of J omega. So this is 20 log base 10, absolute value of one over one plus J omega tau. So let's simplify this. So I have this expression minus 20 log of square root of some term, some function that contains omega. And I want to plot it. So how should I do? What should I do to plot this, this graph? So one idea is, maybe, maybe I'll ask you. So let's say this is 1920. So we are in 1920. So we are going back a hundred years. There's no MATLAB, there is no computer, there is no nothing, okay? We know that we have a first order system based on some physics of the system. And we have computed tau for that particular system. And based on that tau, we have computed H of J omega. And now I want to draw the Bode plot of this particular system. By the way, Bode was, came up with this idea in 1920s. So, so maybe we should talk about 1925 or 1926 when this, uh, this idea was already out, but we have to do it by hand. We don't really have a computer to fall back on. So how should we go about plotting this complicated expression? Any thoughts? You could do some calc stuff where we find like certain qualities of it with maxima minima or like. Right, right. You are getting close. Yeah, you are getting close. Um, let's try to see what happens at extreme values of omega. Okay. What happens at extreme? So what's the extreme values of omega? Well, one is omega close to zero and one is omega much, much larger than zero. Okay, let's just look at the two extreme values. What's happened at two extreme ends of the values of omega. So when omega is close to zero, the omega square tau square is very, very small. So one plus omega square tau square is close to one. So what's log base 10 of one? Let me put an approximation sign. This is 20 log base 10 of one. What is this equal to? 
Zero. Zero. Perfect. Now, what happens when omega is very, very large? So when omega is very, very large, uh, omega square tau square is much, much greater than one. So I can kind of ignore this one here. And so I have 20 log base 10 of omega tau, which can be written as minus 20 log base 10 of omega minus 20 log base 10 of tau. Okay. Remember that when we plot the Bode plot, the x-axis is log base 10 of omega. The y-axis is 20 log base 10 of h of j omega. So for values of omega very small, I am at zero. So I'm, I'm at zero here for omega close to zero. For omega very large, which is this region, what sort of curve am I going to get? So remember, this is minus 20 log base 10 of omega minus 20 log base 10 of tau. So this term seems to be a constant. This is a constant. It doesn't depend on omega at all. It's just a constant. But this term depends on omega. And it gets, so log base 10 omega gets multiplied by minus 20. So what you will see is on this end, it's actually will have a linear slope. So it's a linear function of log base 10 omega. So 20 log uh, j omega is actually a linear function of log of omega uh, for omega is very large. And the slope of this line is equal to minus 20. So that's this minus 20. And it's offset by some constant, which is minus 20 log tau. Okay, any questions so far? So Conor mentioned that we need to look at the maxima and minima using calculus and then try to plot the, uh, the curve. So in this case, what we did was we didn't really look at the maxima and minima, but we did look at the values of omega very, very small, the values of omega very, very large. And then we saw that for small values of omega, the body plot is going to remain, it's going to look flat. And for large values of omega, the body plot is going to just decay linearly with a slope of minus 20. Um, the slope is minus 20. So this is typically said, like if you, if you want to, uh, so this, this particular phenomena has a specific name and it's called body plot has an asymptotic slope of minus 20 decibel, decibel dB per decade. minus 20 dB per decade. So it's quite clear what my, where minus 20 came from. It actually came from here. This minus 20 log base 10 omega. Where does this decade come from? So this decade is basically saying, if I look at, so let's say my omega is large um, and I look at minus 20 log base 10 omega and I look at minus 20 
log base 10, 10 times omega. So I'm, I'm multiplying the frequency by 10. This is exactly equal to minus 20, minus 20 log base 10 omega. So that's where this decade comes from. If you multiply your frequency by 10, you will see that the, um, the change in the y-axis is minus 20 dB per decade. Per decade is for 10 omega. Like you, if you multiply the frequency by 10, uh, then your um, absolute value, 20 log absolute value of H of J omega will reduce by 20 dB. So that's why we say that the Bode plot has an asymptotic slope of minus 20 dB per decade. And these two information, the first information that for small values of omega, the absolute, the, the magnitude is almost zero. Whereas for large values of omega, you have a slope of minus 20 dB per decade. So if I just continue these two curves, then I have a point at which these two curves will intersect. The flat line, which is the values at small frequencies, and this minus 20 dB per decade, which has a slope of uh, minus 20 dB per decade. So these two asymptotes are going to meet at some point and this point is actually one over tau. So let's see why. Okay. Let's see why this should be one over tau. Okay. Let me just do it here. So I know that 20 log H of J omega zero for omega small minus 20 log omega minus 20 log tau or omega large. When are these two curves going to be equal? So I'm going to set the, so I want to look at this intersection point. I want to compute where are they going to intersect. So Oh, I see, it's not one over tau, it's actually tau. This is going to be tau, okay. So we'll set the two things equal. So minus 20 log omega minus 20 log tau is equal to zero. This means omega must be equal to tau. So that's the point at which the two asymptotes are going to intersect. the low frequency asymptote is going to intersect with the high frequency asymptote. Now at this value of omega, so this is all, this is the way people were plotting Bode plots in 1920s. We are just covering what happened in 1920s, how people, how engineers used to plot Bode plot in 1920s. So for omega, it's 20 log one over tau square. Omega equals to, oh, I think I made a mistake. Okay. Sorry, there is, there is a mistake here. Let me write it in a different color. So I have 20 log omega equals to minus 20 log tau. This means omega equals one over tau. So I was right, omega equals one over tau is where the two asymptotes would meet. Does this make sense? I'm sorry for making mistake twice. Hmm. 
now I can compute this easily. This is minus 3 dB. Okay, any questions so far? Let me go over it once more because I made like several mistakes. So I have two asymptotes. One is the low frequency asymptote. One is the high frequency asymptote. I want to know where exactly these two asymptotes would meet. So I set minus 20 log omega minus 20 log tau to zero. I set the, both the quantities to be equal. That's where the two asymptotes would meet. And I get that omega should be equal to one over tau. That's where the two asymptotes would meet. Now at that place, if I compute my 20 log of h of j omega, it turns out to be minus 3 dB. Okay. Now this procedure allows us to plot the body plot more accurately, which is going to be as follows. I have log base 10 omega on this side. I have 20 log absolute value of h of j omega on the other side. So I'm going to start with zero for small values of omega. And then I will converge. This point is going to be one over tau. So at one over tau, this is going to be minus three dB. And I, after that, I'm just going to have an asymptotes, asymptotic slope of 20 dB, minus 20 dB per decade. And this is a quick and dirty way of making a reasonably accurate body plot of a first order system. Okay, so we did basically three things. We looked at what the value of uh, the magnitude plot is going to be uh, around for small values of omega. Then we looked at for large values of omega. We found that it will have a slope of minus 20 dB per decade. Then we figured where exactly are these two asymptotes going to meet and what's going to be the magnitude plot at that particular magnitude value at that particular point, which is one over tau. Uh, that's minus three dB. And that allows us to smoothly compute or show what the body plot is going to look like in this situation for the first order system. Now, the same thing can be done for the phase plot as well. Any questions so far before I move on to the phase plot? Okay. We can do the same thing for the phase plot. So I have my H of J omega. j omega tau. So the angle of h of j omega is tan inverse one over, no. Um, how was the phase computed for a complex number? I forgot. How can I forget? Uh, okay, so a complex number Z is A plus I J B. Oh yeah, so the phase angle of Z is tan inverse B over A. Okay. Oh, but this is one over Z, so I can convert it. I can multiply the top and bottom by one minus j omega tau and I get one plus omega square tau square. Okay, so now this is minus omega tau over one. That's my phase. What is tan inverse of minus t minus x? 
Can I take the negative sign outside? No one wants to attempt this. Well, we can actually take the negative sign outside and so have minus tan inverse omega tau. Now, again, we can do the same thing, which is for small values of omega, this is close to zero. For very large values of omega, this is close to minus pi over two. What happens at the intermediate values of omega? Well, zero for omega, omega less than one over tau. It's minus pi over two for omega greater than, greater than tau, 10 tau. No, 0 0.1 over tau. And then it's, it's an approximation, but minus pi over four log base 10 omega tau plus one. This is an approximation for 0 0.1 over tau less than equal to omega less than equal to 10 over tau. Remember, this is an approximation. So this is not equal, this is just approximate value of tan inverse omega tau. And once again, you can plot it as a function of log base 10 omega. And it's going to look like this. It's the zero, then it decays and then it becomes minus pi over two. So this is zero, this is minus pi over two. And this value is 0 0.1 over tau. This value is 10 over tau. This is a quick and dirty way, or rather easy way to come up with an approximate plot for the phase angle of H of J omega. Okay, so this is what we did. We started with the first order system equation. We computed the, the uh, frequency response of the system. We wanted to compute the Bode plot. We wanted to de depict the Bode plot uh, without using any calculator, without using any computer. So we needed to do some hand calculation. In order, so how do we do the hand calculation? What's the best way to think about it? Well, the best way to think about it is to look at values of omega very, very small, values of omega very, very large. And that allowed us to draw the Bode plot, the magnitude plot uh, as a function of log base 10 omega. So we did that. Now we needed to draw the phase plot. So we did the same procedure, looked at the small values of omega, intermediate values of omega, large values of omega, and we came up with a phase plot. Now, of course, you can use uh, MATLAB or computers nowadays to plot some of these things. So here is what the step response, the impulse response for uh, first order system looks like. It basically goes up to one over tau and then it decays to zero exponentially fast. 
Okay, so tau is typically called the time constant. So within three time constants, the system pretty much decays to zero. Okay. On the other hand, uh, this is the step response. Okay, so it starts it 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 starts from zero at time t equals to zero, and then it starts growing, um, and starts converging to the steady state value of one. And uh, within one time step, within one time constant, it basically achieves the magnitude of one minus one over e. Within three time constants, it's almost almost converts to the steady state value. Okay, so that's why it's called time constant. So you kind of have a rough estimate that within one time constant, how far the system will go. And within three time constants, you pretty much have reached the steady state of the system. And this is how you compute the Bode plot. This is the asymptotic approximation, which is what we did. And this is the actual Bode plot. The difference is 3 dB at one over tau at omega equals one over tau. And if you look at the phase plot, uh, the asymptotic expansion is drawn with uh, the dotted line, which is what we drew in the previous uh, page. And uh, the solid line is the actual phase angle for the first order system. Okay. So the time constant appears in the differential equation just as the coefficient in front of the first derivative, right? Uh, that's right, yeah, you're right. Uh, this is the time constant. And remember that the values here are equal to one, right? So there is no constant here, which means that the constant is one. Um, so time constant is always in relation to all these coefficients that you are seeing. So for instance, if you have five dy over dt plus three yt equals to six xt, then the tau time constant tau will be five over three. That's the time constant. And when I say three time constant, it means that in five seconds, the three tau will be five seconds. So in five seconds, your system will almost reach the steady state. Okay, isn't that cool? Like we can just look at the differential equation and we can say qualitatively uh, where the system would be in five seconds. That's the beauty. Now, the other thing I want you to notice, so look at this, this curve, right? So this curve, as, you, as we know that this curve at one over tau uh, in the Bode plot, at one over tau, you see that the shape changes. This particular point is minus three dB point, and that's one over tau. Now this one over tau, is of course the reciprocal of this tau that you are seeing here. So by looking at the Bode plot and where this mine, where it crosses the minus three dB point, you can actually figure out what the time constant of the system is, right? And then you can multiply it by three and you kind of know that you will converse to the steady state within that time step, within those many seconds. Okay, just by looking at the body plot. So you can actually understand or you can say some qualitative information about the system and its behavior um, just by looking at the body plot. Okay, so once you become an experienced engineer where you are using body plot on a day-to-day -day basis, if I show you a body plot, you can actually tell me a lot about that system um, in, 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 in uh, about the time, time uh, evolution of that system, the step response, as well as the impulse response, just by looking at the Bode plot. Of course, we are not going to go too much detail into that in this particular uh, 3050, but when you take 3551, you actually learn a lot more about Bode plot and how to make these connections. Because within the control theory literature, or not literature, within the control theory, 
it's actually very important for us to know how quickly the system should converge to the steady state value and all that. It's all part of the description or specification for the system. So that's why uh, this body plot stuff is used very heavily within the controls literature because it allows us to uh, make the connection with how the system is going to behave as a um, in with a step input or with an impulse input. Okay, but we are not going to go too deep into that in this class. In this class, we are just exposed to this idea that, oh, we can actually compute body, I mean, we can actually plot body plot and we can uh, do use the inverse Fourier transform to compute the impulse response of, of the system or step response of the system. Okay. Is that, does that make sense? Does that help you see why we are studying Bodhi plot? There's another cool reason why we are studying Bodhi plot, but I'll maybe get back to it towards the end of the class. Now let's look at a second order system. And the uh, Two zeta omega n. This is zeta omega n dy over dt plus omega n square y t equals to omega n square x t. Now, without doing the derivation, I'm just going to write what H of J omega looks like. Okay. This is my absolute value of H, oh, sorry, this is my H of J omega. Now I need to again, come up with the approximations of 20 log H of J omega and angle of H of J omega. So let's look at 20 log base 10 H of J omega. This is actually given by minus 20 log I'm just going to write the expression this now I'm going to go to the approximation. What happens when omega is small? And what happens when omega is large? It's about zero when it's small. Yeah, it's about zero when it's small. What about when omega is large? Okay, let's do what happens when omega is large. So minus 20 log, so I have one is of course very small. So if omega is large, one is of course very small. So I can just replace it by 
omega over omega n raised to 4 plus 4 zeta square omega over omega n square. Okay. Now, omega is large. So, what can I what can I say about this minus 20 log term? Do you think that this power four will dominate this power two term for very large numbers? Right, so 10 raised to four plus 10 raised to two, what is this equal to? approximately equal to this is approximately equal to 10 raised to 4 right so when the numbers are large then the fourth power will always dominate the second power so this is actually approximately equal to 20 log oh i should have a square root somewhere square root square root omega over omega n raised to 4 which is equal to minus 20 log omega n square, which is equal to minus 40 log omega plus 40 log omega n. Okay, please make, uh, there is a square root inside the log. Make sure that you have added that in your notes. And so this is what we get. So here, the asymptotic slope minus 40 dB per decade. Okay, so this is the minus 40 part. And we know why it's called minus 40 dB per decade. So if you multiply the frequency by 10, the magnitude is going to drop by minus 40 dB. That's why it's called minus 40 dB per decade. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Now, if you look at the angle of H of J omega, this is given by minus tan inverse using the same computation we did in the, for the first order system. So we have a negative sign here. And then we have tan inverse of some complicated expression. So we'll get to the Bodhi plot uh, in a few minutes. I just want to derive the impulse response of the system because we haven't done that so far for the second order system. For the first order system, we did the impulse response thing in the previous class. So let's do the impulse response for the second order system. I have h of j omega equals to omega n square okay so how do I 
compute the impulse response. Uh, so I have second order uh, term in the denominator. So I'm going to let, let's call J omega as S. So I have S square plus two zeta omega in S plus omega n square. So let's try to find the roots of this equation. Roots of the polynomial in the denominator. That's what we need to do for partial fraction. So what are the roots? Lambda equals to minus two zeta omega n plus minus square root b square minus four ac. So that's four zeta square omega n square minus four omega n square over two. So I have computed the roots of the denominator polynomial and I get lambda one and lambda two. Those are the two roots for both the cases. Okay, let me call it lambda one and lambda two. The plus sign would be lambda one and the negative sign would be lambda two. So then I have to write H of J omega as some constant M one over J omega plus lambda one plus M two over, or let's say A plus B. That's what we have been using. J omega plus lambda two. And once we have uh, the value of a and b, I can write my h of t as a t raised to lambda 1t plus b e raised to lambda 2t. I'm not going to compute the value of a and b but we know exactly the drill, how to compute the value of A and B given the, um, yeah, given the expression. And then the inverse Fourier transform is pretty straightforward. We have done it so many times. It's A e raised to lambda one T. Well, I have to have UT also because these, uh, the time has to be strictly greater than equal to zero. Okay, so a quick uh, look at the expression. So let's look at the expression when zeta is between zero and one. What kind of behavior are we going to see in the impulse response of the system? So what do we notice for zeta between zero and one? We see that we have a J term here. And we have a negative, so zeta is positive, omega n is positive. So I have a negative zeta omega n. E raised to J omega n square root one minus zeta square. So what do we notice? 
oh, this is time. And then same thing B e raised to minus zeta omega and T e raised to negative J omega n square root one minus zeta square T. This is what we notice when zeta is between zero and one. And it's a decaying oscillations. It has oscillations because of E raised to J terms. And it's decaying because you have E raised to negative something multiplied by T. Any questions so far? Okay. Let's go back to what we were doing, what we have been doing so far. So we have this H of J omega. It's a second order system. So the denominator has second order polynomial in J omega. Uh, we wanted to compute the impulse response of the system. In order to compute the impulse response, we have to take the inverse Fourier transform of H of J omega. In order to get the inverse Fourier transform of H of J omega, I need to use partial fraction. I need to get it into one over J omega plus lambda format. So in order to do that, I have to find the roots of the polynomial in the denominator. So I did that realize that when zeta is between zero and one, the roots are going to look like this. When zeta is greater than one, this is what the roots are going to be. Both roots are going to be real, but, uh, but they may be different. So once we recognize that, now I can use the method of partial fraction to compute the value of A and B for the two cases. And, and I can get the inverse Fourier transform in a very straightforward fashion. Now I realize that when my zeta is between zero and one, then my lambda one has two terms. One is the real term, one is the imaginary term. And so I plug those values in here for zero less than equal to zeta less than equal to one. I realize that the impulse response is going to feature decay oscillations, okay? Because of this decaying, uh, exponential term and the oscillations because of this j omega n term. So that's what my h of t is going <clears throat> So for this values of zeta, I have a decaying oscillation, whereas for zeta greater than one, I just have a decaying exponential terms because there is no oscillation. Okay. Now let's look at the actual simulation. So in this particular plot, you see H of T over omega N for various values of zeta. And for zeta equals to 0 0.1 all the way to 0 0.7, we see oscillations. So things are going below the real line and then going above the, sorry, below the X axis and then goes above the X axis. So these are oscillations. Whereas for zeta equals to one and 1.5, um, there are no oscillations. The term basically just decays to zero. We don't see any oscillations there. Same thing for the step input for zeta equals to one to 0 0.7, we see oscillations in the step response. Whereas in the case of zeta equals to one and 1 1.5, there are no oscillation. It just goes to the steady state value as quickly as possible, like use following the usual trend. This is what the body plot looks like. Um, you see that the uh, slope here is minus 40 dB per decade, as we had predicted. And the angle of phase angle of H of J omega looks like this for various values of zeta, right? So 
all of this can be done using MATLAB. I was going to show you the MATLAB plot today, but perhaps I'll leave it for the next class because we are already out of time. And uh, we'll, we'll try to go over the second order system again uh, and notice some of the important features of this uh, connection between what you see in the Bode plot with what you are seeing in the time response of the system. So we'll talk about it in the next class. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'll see you guys on Monday. Have a thank great day. Thank you. Week. Really quickly before um, I leave, could you go back a couple slides to where you had um, gotten that uh, equation from the, the difference equation, from uh, first order? This one? E yes, that one right there. Okay. I, I didn't have time to write it down. I didn't want to interrupt you when you did. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Uh, I'm going to turn off the recording so you can continue to write. Thank you.